Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about something that's actually important to me. Uh, and I hope it can be important to you as well. Uh, comments, questions, reactions can be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. You can get the email address from there or you can leave a com comment there if you'd like. Um, if you do email me, please include something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam and uh, be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm not very quick about dealing with email. All right, so let's get on with this. Um, I have from time to time talked to you about my personal convictions. Uh, and I, I don't mean my judgments or opinions about, about issues. I mean about the, the convictions, the baseline convictions that drive and inform those judgments about matters. Because I think that everyone who does the kind of thing that I do, who analyzes and comments on current affairs, should do that so that people who see or read them can, have, uh, can put what they say in a context. I've talked in the past about how, like, I'm a green, I'm a leftist, I'm a radical, I'm a democratic socialist, and so on and so on. But there is something I haven't talked about much, if at all, that is also a moral conviction that informs my opinions and judgments. I am also a pacifist, which is something you generally say on TV when you want to lose viewers. But I hope you'll bear with me, uh, at least for this, uh, this next little while. Um, this is why I bring it up now. I mentioned in the last show that I did that I sometimes feel, uh, as I put it, although maybe not originally to me, but I say the world is too much with me. Uh, and for a time, a short time, uh, I'm, I just wind up getting overwhelmed with an emotional awareness of the enormity of the suffering that there is in the world. The hunger, the poverty, the oppression, the homelessness, the exploitation, uh, and also an awareness of how much of that is driven by war. Uh, what got me started this time was the news that there was fighting in Libya. And I, I thought about the fact that I knew that at that moment, there were wars of one sort or another going on in Libya, South Sudan, Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, Gaza, Somalia, Nigeria, Afghanistan, and who knows how many other places. Some of those wars having gone on for decades, some of them with death tolls in the hundreds of thousands or even the millions. That in turn actually uh, prompted me to recall watching on TV the violence in the streets uh, of Chicago uh, outside the Democratic National Convention in 1968 as police attacked anti-war protesters in what an investigating commission later called a police riot. I was watching that, and you, know, you got to understand, you know, I was a teenager, I was young, I was still at home, uh, I was a, politically, I was a good liberal who was having an increasingly difficult time trying to maintain his patriotic support for the Vietnam War, or actually, probably I turned against it by that time, it's not really important here. The thing is, watching the events that night, watching those events unfold on TV, events which, by the way, were actually the origination of the chant, the whole world is watching, uh, watching this, this is my first exposure to actual violence. I don't mean like kids wrestling or kids having a fist fight or that kind of thing. I mean actual violence. I, I still have an image, uh, a memory of an image of, of a cop uh, running down the street. He's got his baton, his club raised up. He's reaching out like this. He's chasing this long-haired kid down the street trying to grab him so he can beat him up. Um, I had a visceral, a very gut reaction, which I described later as saying that uh, a reality of which I was somehow aware was clubbed into my eyes until I had to admit to it. I went to work the next day full of righteous liberal indignation about this, only to discover from my co-workers a chorus of the only thing the cops did wrong is they didn't beat those punks harder. I was so upset, so angry that I just, I just walked out of work. I walked out, walked home. Um, 
I had experienced violence. This is a different sort of violence. This was an emotional, verbal violence, but uh, it still meant I had experienced violence, real violence, for the second time. And the experience changed me, or I suppose more properly, it, it's likely that it, what it did is it brought out something that was already there that, I don't know, it doesn't really matter again. I became in that moment, and, and literally in that walk home, I became what I would later call an emotional pacifist. Emotional in the sense of this not being the result of, of logical discourse or having thought it through. It was rather a reaction in the truest sense of pure conscience. The utter clarity of this cannot be right. That violence, especially organized violence, is wrong. Period. Now, however, being me, I had to see if I could intellectually justify that emotional reaction. So I read pamphlets on pacifism and nonviolence. I read books on pacifism and nonviolence. I read scientific articles about the psychology of violence, both uh, in terms of individuals and in terms of groups. I read histories of nonviolent campaigns, both those which had succeeded and those which had failed. I read essays on the philosophy of government. In other words, the thing is, being me, I had to see if I could make a logical case for a deep moral conviction. Could I make a logical case for conscience? Now, it didn't have to be an airtight case. It didn't be the, ha the kind of case that would convince everybody else. Uh, conscience is intensely personal. In fact, recently on the show, I referred to conscience as the most human of human rights. But the thing is, for me, for myself... Uh, my conviction about organized violence had to be based on something more than an emotional reaction. Uh, it had to be conscience rooted in something beyond itself. It didn't have to be absolute proof, but conscience had to have some logical foundation, at least a logical support to stand on. There had to be some base logical argument you could make. And ultimately, I decided that I could not justify the full extent of my emotional reaction, which is that I would never raise a hand against anyone, no matter what. But I could justify the baseline conviction that large-scale organized violence cannot be right, ever. The big reason for that is that there are alternatives. There is extensive literature on the use of nonviolence, nonviolent action, nonviolent direct action to achieve justice. You know, Gandhi in this, he was just a small part. He was a tiny fraction of that history. In fact, he himself credited Henry David Thoreau as one of his influences. In fact, one story says that he read, he read Thoreau's essay on civil disobedience so many times he had it memorized. Now, that essay on civil disobedience that Thoreau wrote, was uh, he wrote it to explain why he refused to pay a tax levy that was designed to help pay the costs of the war with Mexico in 1848. One of my favorite lines uh, from, the, from the essay, which I think actually is the core of his argument, Referring to a law, he said, if the, if the, if the law, if the injustice uh, is part of the necessary friction of the machinery of government, let it go, let it go, perhaps it will wear itself smooth. But if it is of such a nature that it requires you to be the agent of injustice to another, then I say, break the law. Let your life be a counter friction to stop the machine. What I have to do is to see at any rate that I do not lend myself to the wrong which I condemn. This idea, this concept of using nonviolent action as a means for justice is not only ancient, it goes up to and including what's called nonviolent national defense, that is defending the nation without an army. But of course, if you say this to anybody, if you argue that nonviolence is both a moral and a logical imperative, especially if you say that to politically oriented, politically committed, or involved people, uh, when the issue at hand is a matter of justice or of people resisting oppression, you'll get the standard pushback of how, well, oh, that'd be nice, but it doesn't work, or, or nonviolence only works when everybody's already ready to agree. Uh, and in fact, often enough, this pushback and a kind of curious twist of Godwin's law uh, winds up with some reference to using nonviolence against Hitler. 
And then after all of that, these same people will say how, well, they prefer nonviolence. It's just, it's kind of naive, you know. We prefer that. I'm not glorifying violence, you understand. <laughs> yes, they are. They are glorifying violence. They are glorifying violence as a, indeed, as the only viable, the only reliable means of self-defense and of achieving justice. Uh, some philosophers, like Franz Fanon, um, the openly glorified violence itself, arguing not, not only that is violence the only way the oppressed and colonized people of the world will be liberated, but that the use of violence is in and of itself liberating. I mean, the argument, stripped to its essence, is that nonviolence, well, yeah, it might work sometimes, but violence always does. Nonviolence can fail, but, non, but violence never fails. It just hasn't succeeded yet. The argument allows for no option under which violence fails, even less for an option under which violence fails, but nonviolence succeeds. Even when the conflict goes on, as again, some of these have for decades, in some, in too many minds, including maybe even especially among those directly affected, the thought, violence has failed, never seems to arise. In fact, in fact, when do those looking to excuse the bloodshed for which they are responsible, or which they tacitly or even expressly approve, when do those people describe pacifism and nonviolence uh, in terms other than a doctrinaire or knee-jerk or naive or some equally dismissive adjective? When is the refusal to commit murder not brushed off as hopelessly idealistic, always with the required sigh of regret, uh, undone by those who imagine that revolution or defense are marked by how many you kill rather than by how many you change? And do that, oh, except, of course, this is for the times when they denounce the use of nonviolence as a tool of the ruling class. And no, I need no lectures on the, de on the destructiveness of institutional violence, nor do I need to be reminded that it's easy for us who are not suffering under the yoke of an oppressor to urge the oppressed to forswear a murderous violence, especially when it is equally easy for those of us to, who embrace such violence as necessary when we don't have to live with the blood and the gore and the shredded limbs and the screams of the wounded and amid the wails of the wounded and the widows and the orphans who are sitting in the rubble and smoke of what had been their homes and fields. That is the painful reality, the actual reality behind that necessity of violence. A reality of tens of hundreds of millions around the world, past and present, oppressed by military power of some sort of another, always, in, if not always, in the pursuit of some higher purpose. A real effect of real violence on real people. We're going to take a quick break and then we're going to come right back to this. As I said before, Wars of one sort or another are now going on in who, may, who knows how many different places. And in every one of them, you can be damn sure that no one on any side has picked up a gun or dropped a bomb or fired a rocket or laid a mine or set a booby trap without claiming to be on the side of the angels. No one has blown someone's head off or burned a village to the ground or tortured a prisoner without claiming it's in the pursuit of justice or freedom or self-defense or the glory of God or Jesus or Allah or whoever. That is the reality. Not musings about how you'd prefer nonviolence, or if only you could do nonviolence, or not musings about self defense, or about horribly the creative aspects of violence. It's the reality, rather, of death, destruction, and despair, in which everyone involved claims that they are the wounded innocents couple of quotes for you. Those who organized this provocation deliberately desired a further aggravation of the international situation by striving to smear us, sow hostility toward us, and cast aspersions on our peace-loving policies. Now, something said by who? Maybe the rebels in Ukraine, or maybe about the rebels in Ukraine? Neither. It's from a TASS wire service dispatch, September 3rd, 1983. It's about us. 
to save the freedom of the world, to save liberty, to save the honor of women and children, everyone who loves freedom and honor, everyone who puts principle before ease and life itself before mere living, is banded in a great crusade, we cannot deny it, to kill Muslims, to kill them not for the sake of killing, but to save the world, to kill them lest the civilization of the world be killed. Now, other than being blunter than most, is this truly different from many sentiments expressed during our war on terror? But in the original version, Muslims was Germans, and the quote comes from a sermon preached by the Bishop of London during World War I. We concur, them, uh, we concur in considering them as totally without morality, insolent beyond bearing, inflated with vanity and ambition, aiming at the exclusive domination of the world, lost in corruption, of deep-rooted hatred toward us, hostile to liberty wherever it endeavors to show its head, and the internal disturber of the peace of the world. Now, the style may be stilted, but I defy anyone to tell me any fundamental difference between those sentiments and those directed against Hamas to justify the attack in Gaza, or for that matter, different from those directed against Jews by any number of anti-Semites across the ages. But the year was 1815. The speaker was President Thomas Jefferson, and the them involved was Great Britain. It's always the same. It's always the same. Every time the same arguments are trotted out. They are evil, corrupt, cruel. They can't be trusted. They understand only force. They don't respect human life the way we do. It's sad, but they have given us no choice. Blah, blah, and more blah as we go about convincing ourselves that they are fundamentally other, fundamentally different. And so when we kill them, except of course, we don't actually kill them. We secure targets. We achieve objectives. We deny the enemy resources. So when we kill them, there are none left behind to mourn. For the other has no wife or husband, no sons or daughters, no sisters, no brothers, no parents, no aunts or uncles or grandparents or cousins or friends or neighbors or co-workers. They are merely an instrumentality of the enemy, denied their humanity so they can be denied their life because they are other and so not really alive, not like we are. It's been charged that nonviolence gives fear and hatred an opportunity to triumph. I say that with murderous violence, fear and hatred always triumph. I say that might does not make right. I say that the ends do not justify the means, which no matter how many colors you lay on it, is the primer under the whole argument for violence. The ends do not justify the means, but they are affected by them. That humanity cannot be conveniently divided into our friends, the victimized innocents, and our foes, the venal infidels. That war solves no problems except as it replaces them with new ones. That mass murder does not bring any peace except that of the graveyard. That hatreds produce, do not produce love. That a river of blood, no matter how thick, deep, wide, or red, does not, cannot, will not mark the path to justice. Because justice must be for them as well as for us, for enemy the same as for friend, or it's not justice at all, but mere favoritism. Ultimately, I agree with Gandhi's statement that the only thing worse than violence, quoting him, the only thing worse than violence is cowardly refusal to act in the face of injustice, but nonviolent action is always superior to violent action. Contrary to the underlying, uh, underlying unspoken conviction of those who, despite their claims to the contrary, do endorse mass violence, pacifism does not mean passivity, and nonviolence does not mean non-action. They do not involve, as I was once accused of advocating, allowing ourselves to get butchered in order to be morally superior. But let me be clear, okay? I believe that we are responsible for that which we approve, which we advocate, and that applies to me as much as to any others, in fact, maybe more to me, because I make the decision so consciously. I know the course that I've chosen carries risks. I know that nonviolent action isn't safe, that it may, and for some circumstances, surely would involve risking lives, and that the greatest risk is that of failure, of seeing injustice ascendant. But every one of those risks applies equally strongly to violent action, which carries the added risks, risks so often uh, that they're less a risk than a process. The risk is of destroying that which you say you'd approve and of becoming that which you say you oppose. Nonviolent action is not without risk, not without pain, not without suffering. And aggressive nonviolent techniques, such as economic sanctions, can put that suffering on others, including innocents. 
No, there are no ironclad guarantees of success. And yes, there would be losses as well as victories. All of that, all of that, despite any romanticized notions to the contrary, is equally true of violence. Now, I can understand the lure of violence. Really, I can. With violence, more than with nonviolence, you can feel that you're doing something. You can see the result of an action. For just an example, we don't have to look any further than Israel and the Palestinians. I'm quite sure that every time Hamas or some other militant group fires a rocket into southern Israel, it feels like they're striking a blow against the oppressor. Even though after decades of violence against Israelis, they're no closer to justice or a homeland of their own. Israelis, for their part, no doubt feel that the incursions in the West Bank, the bulldozing of homes, the slaughter in Gaza are somehow landing telling blows against the threat. Even though after decades of violence against Palestinians, they are no closer to security or peace. Violence has clearly failed for both these antagonists, and yet neither one seems willing or maybe even able to acknowledge it. So it's simply not true that there's no choice. Even less that the only choice is between murderous violence and passivity. There is a choice. The choice of seeking to preserve life rather than to destroy it. To think in terms of we rather than us versus them. To control conflict rather than to cry havoc. To, in short, struggle to achieve just ends while minimizing the suffering of opponents rather than maximizing the suffering of enemies. That is the choice of nonviolence and of nonviolent action. It is nonviolence, not violence, which eschews hate and fear and thereby offers our best and ultimately our only hope for long term peace and justice. Most people, probably most all of you, I fully realize regard that as hopelessly romantic. I find it eminently practical. Not only because, as Edmund Burke once said, a conscientious man should be cautious in how he deals in blood, but because, as a Life magazine editorial put it, August 20th, 1945, quoting, our sole safeguard against the very real danger of a reversion to barbarism is the kind of morality which compels the individual conscience, be the group right or wrong, there is no other way. There is no other way way. The choice was once described as chaos or community. And another way of describing that, it's a choice between embracing life and embracing death. And if we are to be fully human, I say we have to embrace life. And I realize that in the course of this, I have spoken not at all about the practicalities of nonviolent action, the practicalities of techniques and methods, um, everything from mass non-cooperation down to simply signing a, signing a petition, um, the, the varieties from small to large, from individual to group, from short term to long term. I haven't talked about any of that because... That's not really what I intended to talk about. I tell you what, if somebody out there feels that they, that they need convincing, all right, talk to me about techniques. Talk to me about how you do this. Don't give me philosophy or conviction. Give me the actual hows. I'll come back. I'll do more on this. All right? That's, a, that's my promise. Um... I will talk about the history of nonviolence. I will talk about, I will talk, in fact, I will tell you tales about how nonviolence did compete against Hitler and win. I will talk to you about cases where nonviolence did uh, compete against murderous dictators and win. I will talk to you about how nonviolence works and has worked and can continue to work. But for the moment, I'm just going to wrap this up here. I'm just going to leave it right there. Um, I felt that you should know my convictions. I felt that you should know um, what I believe. And I felt that you should know um, why I believe it. Again, if you want to know about the hows rather than the whys, just let me know and we'll talk about that. But for the moment, again, I'm going to leave it. We will see you next week. So for the moment, you have the best week you possibly can, and truly, truly, peace.